Hey guys, Rodney Miller here with Hard Money Partner, and uh, today I'm honored to be with Jimmy Martz. Uh, he is a truly inspiring individual. He uh, he's done a lot in the last few years, and he's going to talk about it a little bit here with you guys. And, and Jimmy and his uh, wife Jennifer own Jimco Properties, um, real estate investment firm, um, and and his. Before he got into real estate, uh, Jimmy was a former, he is the former Dell City High School band director, um, was with them for many years and led them to some state titles and did some really cool stuff before he decided to transition to real estate. And uh, Jimmy went from zero to 69 plus rental units uh, in five years. He's going to tell us how he did that and how he he uh, quit his W-2 job. So welcome, welcome to the show, Jimmy. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me out, Rodney. I appreciate it. Looking forward to it. Yeah, so we, we've we known each other for a couple of years now, and, and I can't, when did we have our first meeting? Where, where When and where did we meet? We, we got together for for uh, some coffee at Starbucks probably probably two or three years ago. That's I did right. It, uh, during my lunch break, I remember, in between, in between uh, the morning and afternoon classes, so... Yeah, things have changed quite a bit since then. But yeah. oh, we've gone full circle. We had coffee there a couple of weeks ago, and that's what kind of led to this interview. Talked Absolutely. about where you know where you you know all you'd accomplished in in those couple of years or before even before that. But but uh, you didn't have to take a lunch break the last time we met, did you? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't. I don't have to. My schedule's a lot more um, a lot more open now for sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and you've got a you got a lot going on, but uh, we'll get into that. But just kind of tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, you know your W two before you got into real estate, and, and we'll just start there. Sure. You know, I got into uh, you know I was in I was a teacher, like you said, band director at Dell City. Um, love that community, love that district. Great experiences um, through and through when it comes to. Uh, you know, everything that I did over there. And uh, I still have reverence for, for all those guys that I was working with and the, uh, the teachers over there and everything else. Uh, it was, it was a good job. It was, it was a lot of fun and man, there's a lot of really cool kids there and just the community's great. Um, but I live in Oklahoma. We all know, we all know about what teachers get paid in Oklahoma and those of us who, you know, have been on the inside of the amount of workload that it takes to be a successful band director and to do it right, to do it the way that, you know, really, um, you know, takes care of the kids, takes a lot of time. So uh, basically, when me and my wife decided we were going to have a start having children, um, I told her that I would find a way to make sure that I was going to be a good dad, make sure I was going to be at home because that was not really happening all that much um, while I was while I was doing the band director thing. Tell I us gave, about your schedule because you were you were telling me kind of how what your schedule looked like back then. Kind of tell us what a typical day was like for you, all the stuff you had going on. Boy, it was it was uh, it was pretty crazy. I mean, there was a full schedule and then some. I mean, during marching season, it was just kind of understood that that was pretty much the entire sum of my life um, during from summer band camp all the way until November when football season was over and marching band was done. Um, you know, you got evening practices, you got Friday night football games, you have competitions on Saturdays. I mean, I think I, I think at one point I made the mistake of counting how many free Saturdays I had in an entire semester and the number was five. And that was we're talking five months you know, five, six months. And I was like, wow. But, um, you know, I mean, that, that came, that comes with the job. If you're going to take the job, you got to be, you got to be willing to do the work to take care of the kids. Sure. So, it was really cool. I, I really dug it. It was a lot of fun, but it took, it took every bit of time that I had to do it right. And, you know, when Corbin was born, my son, I started researching about the real estate stuff. And then by the time he was about one and a half, two, we, we bought our first property and we were just using the Burr strategy by 
nice houses that have been run down that are in good neighborhoods. Buy them at a discount. Don't spend too much on the rehab, and uh, and then and then uh, refinance them. Get all of your money back and roll it into the next deal. So and this was what uh, year? Give it what year was this around? Twenty sixteen or when, when was this? Yep. So we bought our first rental property February of two thousand sixteen, and um, you know that one. It took me three times as long then as it does now to do a rehab. You know that learning curve in the beginning is steep, but it was were a. You doing, uh, were you doing the work yourself at that point? Were you in there? Quite a bit, yeah. Slinging um, paint and you know doing doing all the whatever, physical labor. Whatever needed to be done that I could that I could do, I did. And if it was something easy enough for me to learn on YouTube, I probably figured it out and did it. You know, so pretty much took care of most everything on the first couple. But so you don't have a background. You don't have a background in construction or anything like that. You no. you, you basically yeah. you basically had to get out there, get crack the books, watch the YouTube videos and figure it out. Correct. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't know anything about any of it, really. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to, to figure out how to paint and do that stuff well. And I could mow a lawn, you know, in landscape, but. Aside from that, you know, pick up things here and there. But when you don't have a safety net, you pretty much have to, uh, you just have to figure it out. Yeah. The reason I'm asking you that is because uh, I hear, you know, you get a lot of people, uh, you know, people take me to lunch and want to know how to do this and all that. And, and, and a lot of people throw up their own roadblocks. I don't know anything about a house. I don't know how to paint or remodel a house. I, I don't know anything. But the other big one that you seem to have, uh, push through is I don't have time. I've got a full-time job. I'm busy. My job and my kids and my wife keep me so busy. I don't, uh, I don't have time to learn this and, and take down a property and rehab it. So you, I mean, you were literally working yourself to the bone just with your full-time job. And somehow you were able to make, make time to, to, to put into this. Tell me about that, how you made that work because a lot of people, think that's an insurmountable uh, barrier to them getting in into become an entrepreneur in general or be getting into real estate. Sure. So it was, it was a survival skill. It wasn't a convenience. I mean, when the last several years that I was a head band director, I had three jazz bands, two concert ensembles, the marching band, the band that went to the athletic events, played the basketball games, and uh, towards the end of my career, I was also uh, helping out with the orchestra program as well, overseeing the middle school band programs and uh, managing a staff of private lesson teachers that were over there. That was what my full-time job was. So, I mean, finding- And that carried over into your weekends, correct? Oh yeah, it, it, there, wasn't, there wasn't much time off. And I mean, it really just comes back to mindset. If you decide that you're going to do it, then you find you find that time. And that time in the beginning was time that I used to spend sleeping, you know. It's that's what it was, but I say it's a survival skill because I had to figure out a way to make it work until I got to that point. And um obviously there were sacrifices that had to be made in order to, et, to carve out that time to be able to learn what I needed to do and get these rehabs done and go through the process, especially in the beginning when you're first learning. So, um, but yeah, learning the learning time management was something I had already figured out pretty well because I already had so many balls in the air when it came to uh, the band directing job. I heard a saying a long time ago, and it really stuck with me, that if you want to get something done, find a person that's super busy and give them the task. <laughs> you don't find somebody that's, you know, that's got the time and sitting around because the people that are super busy will find out how to get it done. It's Yeah, it's absolutely the truth. <laughs> it's funny <laughs> you mentioned that. That's That's kind of something that I noticed time and time again with those band parents that were always stepping up helping. It's like, they were, they had full-time jobs. A lot of them, they were busy people, but they always, they always made time, you know, it was important and they did it. Yeah. So, yeah. Really Tell me about that. early on, you know, you're a band teacher, not making a ton of money. 
Um, tell me about the finance part of this, going to banks and, 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 and developing those relationships, you know, when you're trying to build something, but you don't have a lot of experience because that's another barrier people throw up. Well, you know, the banks won't take me seriously. I don't have a big, you know, balance sheet, you know, to back up my, you know, you know, my deals, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't have a bunch of money sitting in the bank. How did that all work out? Was that, was that, was that difficult for you building those relationship and getting, getting the capital to fund these deals? Or um, was that not a big, too big of an issue? It was an issue. It's yeah. Going from, going from zero to one is, is the hardest, the hardest uh, barrier to get over. And it took me way longer than I thought it should have, but you just, you just keep pushing. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things that you mentioned there that we could, we could delve into, but since money is one of the big hurdles that people have to deal with i mean the way i did it personally was i spent a long time paying off uh making extra payments and paying off the, our primary residence and then getting a uh, line of credit that i could use to make cash offers um knowing what i know now i could have i could have done it differently and probably gotten started a lot sooner um but the uh when it came to talking to banks to get financing on that stuff a couple things that uh that i did that helped me out in the beginning was i was listening to a lot of podcasts and reading books and watching youtube videos about how people are doing this stuff but there's another step to that that i think a lot of people miss you need to like you need to either if you're listening to a podcast while you're driving use the voice memo part of your phone and stop it long enough to make a note about something you need to go back and look into or have a notebook in front of you that when something comes across you're like oh that's a great idea you make a note of it and that notebook becomes your to-do list so you're not just flying blindly with good intentions not knowing exactly where to go or what to do and um, that helped out quite a bit and another one other one other thing that seemed to really uh, stand out with the banks with every with every property that I that I did especially in the beginning I took before pictures and then I took pictures after it was all done and then made a little a little PowerPoint presentation where I could just get slides and show the before pictures on one side the after pictures on the other side and it's you go to a bank and it's like this is what my rehabs costed after it was all said and done this is what the before and after pictures look like please make sure to give this stuff to the appraiser because I want to make sure that I get an appraisal that allows me to be able to get all my money back so I can move on. Yeah. And that little, that, that extra little step right there, um, I think helped out quite a bit because most people don't take the time to do that. And it kind of set me apart as taking it more as a, taking it more as a business rather than just being a weekend warrior hobbyist. Sure. That's a go. That's a gold nugget, man. The little details will go a long way. If you can pick up little nuggets here and there and, and, and like that nugget you just gave us, um, they'll, they'll take you a long way. Like I knew a guy early on that, that kind of started like you did and kind of like I did, but, um, but he built his own resume for the banks and he would have a, he had a binder and it showed some, like he'd done a few deals. He showed the deals before and after, it showed, you know, it just had his, re he, he took this to the banks and he took it one step further than most people do. And he gave them here, this is all about me and what I know and what I'm doing. And, and it was just really impressive uh, way to go about it. That he, he, I mean, and most people don't do that. They show at the bank and they don't have any documents. They don't really have anything. They're just unorganized. So, and little things like that make a big difference. It does. And I had three or four things in that binder, the before and after pictures. I had the financials. I had a copy of the rent, uh, the lease agreement, um, all put together. And I'd have one for each property. And then when you get the appraisal back, you add that appraisal. So you can, you can show, you know, even if you only have one or two or three, you're starting to create a track record for yourself, showing that you not only know how to do the quality of work, you know how to get the tenants, you know how to get market rent, and you know how to, when you start doing that stuff, it shows that you know how to talk to the banks. 
Yeah. So you probably went from zero to hero in a very short amount of time with the banks. And now they're probably chasing you down because you set yourself apart from the average person. You know, the yeah. weekend warrior, like you say, that's taking down deals. He's transactional. He's just doing deal after deal, not really thinking about the business aspect of it. You're building a business. You're building an empire. You're building, you're building something. And it takes business skills. And it takes little nuggets like that and little you got to think of it like a bit. This is a business, man. This isn't just uh, looking for your next transaction. You're building something. If you're doing it right and you Absolutely. want sustainability and you want to be in this business long term and make this something you can pass on to your grandkids, you're not just doing deals. You're building something. So, yeah, the first deal was something I bought on the county court step, uh, the courthouse steps. And uh, it, but it, the first deal taught me a lot, but the second deal was the one that gave me the trajectory that I needed. And I think that one's more interesting to talk about because I was putting out law. I was, I think of, I think of lead generation, like fishing, cause I love to go fishing. And when I go fishing, I throw out like four or five different lines with different baits to see what's biting. Mm -hmm. And I, I really related to that when I was doing my marketing, when I was, before I had ever bought my first rental, I was, I was doing anything that I'd heard on any podcast. Um, I was writing letters uh, and sending it to people that had houses that looked like they needed work, um, driving for dollars. I was putting those stupid bandit signs on the side of the road, seeing if I could generate some leads. Done that. That was a pain. I don't do it anymore. Thank <laughs> goodness. But yeah, hey, you, when you decide you're going to do it, you just got to get out there and set your ego aside and do what, do what needs to be done. And, uh, you know, that amongst, you know, calling for sale by owner signs that you see, checking on Craigslist to see what kind of things you might find on there, Facebook Marketplace. I mean. Well, yeah, let's back up because a lot of people don't have any money to, to dump into, into advertising. So I always tell people, if you want to get in this business, they're like, well, how do I find deals? Well, you got, there's two ways. You can spend some money or you're going to spend some time. Money or time? What do you have? Do you have money? Do some postcards. Do some do some things. But if you have more time than money, like you said, driving for dollars, cheap bandit signs, um, learning the foreclosure process, knocking on doors of people in foreclosure. You got to learn how to find find these people in foreclosure through the court system. Um, make door hangers and go stick them on doors. I know a guy that used to do stick uh, just post it notes on vacant houses. Because eventually the people are going to show up to mow the lawn or something, you know, it's just, you, right. you know, driving for dollars where you just drive around and you you try to find the overgrown houses. There's ways to do it. It's long. It's painful. It's not easy. You, you'll do a lot of work before you see a lot of return. But it's just, you know, it's, it's kind of what you have to do. Yeah. And the reason you, you hit exactly on why I like to talk about the second deal, because the first deal I use my line of credit. And I use the systems that I had gotten put together to that point. But I said that I would do it differently if I knew then what I know now. And the second deal is what taught me that because I put out all of these lines trying to find, trying to snag a good deal. And I got my first deal. And then three weeks later, someone calls me in one of those bandit signs. And I was, I was like, crap, I don't have any money to take this deal down. And I was like, should I even go and talk to this guy? I don't have any money. Everything that I had is put into my first deal. And three weeks later, here it is. I'm getting another deal. It looks like it's pretty good. So I told my wife, I was like, I'm going to go out there. I'm going to make an offer that's low enough that one, it could make sense about no matter how I slice that pie, it's going to be a good deal. And two, I'm building in financing for hard money and if the deal makes sense and I can get it at a price where I can finance in the hard money, then I can talk to guys like you mm -hmm. who have those resources and have the skills to be able to underwrite it, make sure it's a good deal. And so I ended up, I ended up using hard money on that second deal and that made the difference for me. It really did because it taught me that I didn't necessarily need to have a bankroll to mm -hmm. be able to, continue to grow. I think if it wasn't for that second deal, I probably would have just been doing one, finish it, refinance it, sure. and, then start, and then start looking again. 
But every time you stop that process of marketing, you have to like start that ball rolling again. And starting over from scratch every single time you're looking for your next deal is when it really starts to get difficult. Yeah, and I learned but, it the hard way because I did hard money. I, I borrowed hard money when I was early on, but the, I think that the lesson learned is that um, the cost of not doing a deal is greater than the cost of the money, the borrowing money. So you might be fudging over three to four uh, percentage points or, uh, you know, some points or whatever. But what comes down to it, if it's a good deal, it comes down to the fact that if it's a good deal, it's a good deal. And it should be able to support, most deals should be able to support paying a little more money. If you get to the point to where you're like, I can't even look at that deal because I don't have the money. Yeah, that's, you never, you never want to be there. You never want to pass on a deal because you don't have the money. And so who's the hard money lender you use? I don't mind naming names. Um, there was a guy named Scott England and he was, uh, is he, he was, a doctor? Scott no, Eng why don't I know he that? He used name? to be a banker. Okay. He used to be a banker. I actually met him through bigger pockets. Okay. And, um, I just reached out to him because he seemed like he was active on there. And, you know, between that and going to the different local meetups and, uh, organizations that are designed for real estate investors, sure. you just try, you just get out there and try to meet people. But he was, he was that guy that, uh, you know, when I got to that point where I was ready to start pulling the trigger and putting offers out, um, I could call him and say, am I on the right track here? He already yeah. had, he already had 20 rentals at that point. Yeah. And he knew. And just that one, just having that one connection that I made with someone who knew what they were doing and could say, it's a good deal. If you decide to pass on it, let me know. Cause I'm going to buy it. When you get someone, yeah. when you get someone that's like that, it's yeah. like that, that'll tell you that, which is, then it, then it gives you that confidence you need. Sure. But you got to go out to the meetups and you got to, you got to actually reach out to people through, through the meetups or through bigger pockets or even the virtual meetups these days. You got to get out there, man. That's where you meet the wholesalers right. too. But, but I'm going to, I'm going to reject, I'm going to do a shameless plug here. What we do when we loan money, instead of us sending out an appraiser from a bank, we have two very experienced rehab flippers and they're the ones that go out and, and look at their house. They look at your budget, your rehab plan. They look at the ARV, the comps. They And not only will they tell you or look for like, you know, catastrophic bombs that you've missed to help you, but they'll, they'll look at your deal and they'll reassure you if it's, if it's a good deal, mediocre deal, whatever, but they'll also tell you that you're under rehabbing it. You need to do granite and you can, you know, put, five grand more into this deal and get 25 grand more out of it because the comps say that. So they're, they've been doing this for 25 years each. So 50 years of experience. So oh, you're yeah. not just getting a freaking appraisal. You're getting a second set of eyes on your deal that are going to kind of coach you along, you know? So I think that's kind of, kind of a big deal. That is a big deal. Cause if you don't, if you've never done it before, then having someone there that's going to say, yes, you're on the right track or your rehab budget is not lining up with what reality is going to show you very, very soon. And that happens and, a lot. Yeah. And then, and then you're the ARV. We get a lot, I get a lot of deals where the ARV is way off and the, and the guy's just taking some realtors word for it. And they're, you know, well, it's in Midwest city. And so is my house. Well, that doesn't work that way. Every, every, it's different, dude. You can't go five miles away from your house. There's a whole, whole, never, whole other area. We're trying to save your ass because we could loan you the money and we could make you know our, our points and fees off of you, but we don't want to see you regretting your decision because you'll never come back to us. So you know we have to kind of like tell them. And there's a lot of people that come to us that we get a lot of newbies that come to us and I'm like, okay, what's the purchase price? What's the rehab? What's the ARV? What's ARV? I don't even know what that is. We're like, you need to go, you need to stop, go read some books and learn the business because you don't know, you know, you don't even know. Yeah, what so, so there's so many people that probably will, ne will never even call you because they're afraid that that conversation is going to make them look like they don't know what they're talking about. So if that's, if that's, if that person is listening right now, you need to back it up and listen to those three things that he's going to ask you. If you don't, yeah, know I'm not here. I'm trying to keep you kind of keep you from losing your ass, but I'm not trying to be a dick. I was the same person. I started just like you did. I made, I made mistakes on my three first rehabs. So I'm, I'm not doing that. You know, I think you're right. I think a lot of people don't want to be told that they're on the wrong track, but, um, 
that's just part of this business, man. If you have somebody that's going to like let you keep you from going down a bad path, you just need to open open your ears and listen and, and, and take the advice because it's good advice. I want to make loans. I would love to make loans to everybody because one thing guaranteed is that if you have a 750 credit score or a 700 credit score and you do a bad deal, I'm still going to make money. So it doesn't really matter to me. Um, right. But I would like to keep you happy. And, and I don't want to see you get burned on your first deal or first couple of deals. I want to see you do good deals. And if I can keep you out of trouble, I, I'm going to try to do it. So anyway, I'll stop preaching. Hey, you know, when I was trying to buy bigger deals, um, I got I got turned down many, many times before I actually was able to get one to the finish line. Because when I started looking into bigger deals, they're like, have you considered this, this, this? Because it might, it might be a little bit different than what you expect. And it kind of skewed the numbers in a way that made it not as good as a deal as I thought it was. But I never really thought about, uh, I never thought of it being a waste of time because I, I picked up this idea somewhere, probably some podcasts I listened to, but they called it collecting your nose. And, you know, it's a sales, it's a sales concept where, you know, if you make vote, if you make cold calls, you're going to get, you're going to get maybe 5% of the people to actually listen to your pitch. So instead of feeling like the first 19 people that you call are a waste of your time, you could you can change your philosophy on it and think of collecting your nose because you understand that 5% of that time, you're actually going to be able to get a sale out of it. And even though there was a lot of a lot of deals that I that I uh, pursued that ended up not even materializing into a purchase, I figured that I was learning along the way figuring out what the banks want, figuring out what the hard money lenders are wanting, figure out what everybody's looking for. And you collect those no's and, you know, follow the, you know, just follow the numbers and you'll realize that if only 5% of the time you get the deal, okay, do it 20 times. If you understand that concept, sure, you don't feel like you're wasting your time, even though you get a lot more no's than you do yeses. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's, let's, let's get in some of your deals. Let's get into your trajectory to where let's start from that first house you bought at the sheriff's sale. And we'll kind of like go through some of your rentals and then you got in some multifamily deals and, you know, and then at some point you were able to replace your income and, uh, you know, quit your W2. So let's, let's, let's just kind of, if you can just give us the abbreviated version of kind of how you, how you went from one rental property purchased the sheriff's sale to 60, 68, five years later and, yep. and self-employed. So yeah, take us through that journey. Um, spent, spent about a year and a half learning, started, got my LLC put together, started making offers, um, got the first one. So, did, so, so you quit your job right off the bat, right? Because you you quit your job before you bought your first house, right? Because that's the way you do it. Uh, nope. <laughs> I was I was uh, working as as the band director. We already talked about that, all the way until uh, all the way until COVID, and I was planning on finishing out that year, and then COVID happened, and I never got to say I never got to say goodbye to all my kids. You know, it really that really kind of sucked. I was I'm still kind of disappointed that that turned out that way but a lot of my kids didn't get to go to their graduation that year either so it was just the way it was but you know I spent the first three years taking care of you know buying one house at a time and rolling that money over using the birth strategy I was buying about four to five a year and so you're you know one every two and a half three months uh, is is about the time frame it was taking me once I kind of got started and got going. And um, it took me about three years to get to the point where I had enough, I had enough of a net worth and enough experience to where I could start looking towards bigger deals. So in December of 2019, I bought a portfolio of 11 houses and that uh, that that was a good deal. And uh, I bought it for eight ninety five. It appraised for a little over one point one, the day that I closed on it. So it was it was solid, but you can't, um, but you can't start there 
because if you don't have the net worth to be able to sign a personal guarantee, then it doesn't matter how big a deal you want to sign your sign your name to. If your net worth that if your net worth doesn't back it up, then you know you're going to have a hard time doing it on your own. We can talk about bring on business partners and doing other strategies, but mm -hmm. that's that was kind of where I was with it. Well, that's and, that's uh, pretty fast. 2016, you bought your first house. 2019, you took down 11 houses in one package. That took me. So yeah, that took me to a little over 30, and I bought I think you know four or five more after that. Nice. Um, and I was at I was at 34 when I retired from teaching. Okay. And um, and then. I mean, by the time I got to that point, things just seemed to, I, I had the confidence, I had the experience, I had the relationships with the bankers at that point. And since I've retired, I bought a portfolio of duplexes and I bought an eightplex. Um, and then I bought another duplex and I probably bought about four, four or five more houses. And, um, and so in the last year and a half, since I retired from teaching, I've doubled, I pretty much doubled the portfolio. And um, that's kind of where we are with it right now. Um, so that's yeah, amazing, man. That, that, that's some, that's some serious growth. I mean, that, that is, uh, you know, that's pretty inspiring to folks that, that are still on the fence and maybe in 2016, we're still thinking about doing real estate and they haven't pulled the trigger yet, you know, cause they didn't know how to do it, but I mean, it can be done. People are doing it and you're living proof of that. You just got to get out there and do it. Yeah, you got to put your ego aside. You got to be humble. You got to realize that you're going to have to ask other people for their advice and and take the advice and learn from it. And um, it can be done. One of the things that I, that I tell people that are first getting started is that, uh, you know, do your rehab as if you're going to hire out everything and then be willing to do some of that stuff yourself if it really comes down to it because that little detail will make the difference between pulling the trigger or just sitting back and being stuck with analysis paralysis because you're never you know you're never going to know everything i mean but you still got to be able to get started um yeah so no I, I agree i agree I, I you know early on i painted some walls and got up on a roof and tore off the roof, screwed my back up in the process, <laughs> tried to, you know, I want to do a little bit of everything to kind of get yeah. a feel for what it, you know, what it was like and, and uh, did some sheetrock, did, did some of that stuff, probably not to the extent that I needed to, but uh, it's good to go through if you're going to do this. I wouldn't make it a habit of doing it long term, but to learn every aspect of rehabbing a house from the, from the flooring to the countertops, sheetrock, lighting fixtures, all that, just to learn the process is good. Yeah. I mean, if, if you have, if you have big ambitions, you won't be doing that stuff forever because you'll get too busy taking care of the other details as the business grows, but learning those skills on the front end, when you only have a few properties really makes it a lot easier when you start hiring out contractors to do it because they can't BS you at that point. You already know, you already know all the, all the things that, you know, you know, a good work looks like, and you know, a bad work looks like, yeah. and you, you can't have someone pull the wool over your eyes. If you've, if you've been in there and actually done it before. Sure. Sure. And so, yeah, you start off, you can do all that stuff, but then you want to, you want to graduate out of there. Cause really the, where the rubber meets the road is you need to be out there chasing deals. You need to spend most of your time. You can manage those projects, but you need to be generating leads for new deals. Cause if you don't find deals, you're dead in the water. So your main, objective eventually should be to be chasing down deals, marketing and, and filling that funnel full of deals. Cause that's, what's going to, you know, it's fuel to your growth. If you don't have deals, you don't have a business, you know? So what's your, you know, you, you're, you're, you're trucking along. You, you've got a good tra trajectory going. I, I think you're going to probably keep it up. So what do you think the next couple of years, few years look like for you? What do you want to be doing? What do you, what do you plan on doing? And what do you, where do you see yourself, you know, five years down the road? Five years is a long ways away, but uh, especially when it looks like what I've done just in the last 12 months, but I'm making offers on apartment complexes, 40 to 50 units. Um, I'm educating myself 
on some of the other aspects of commercial real estate, uh, retail strip centers, medical, industrial, um, those types of commercial spaces. Uh, that's something I might I might uh, might jump into, just because some of those aspects look like they're a little bit less uh, less involved on a day to day basic basis than you know handling one single family rental that's going to come open every every year yeah every other year sure um, so I mean I'm just going to keep buying good deals as they as they present themselves and hopefully as my net worth grows i'll be able to have doors open into other products that will be you know that basically just have more zeros behind them yeah i think i think your your the natural evolution is probably yeah start looking at commercial because i mean when you think about it you could double your units with one deal you find a 65 70 unit complex and you right. can double again once you learn how to do a bigger complex and double again yeah, absolutely and once you get 70, 80 units in one location with one property, you can start hiring property management companies to manage that one individual apartment apartment business, because that's what they are. They're just little mini businesses. And then the scalability just gets gigantic because then you can get to 200, 300 units. You know, it, it, the scalability is used, but it all starts with, you know, most of us all start with that first single family home. And we take our blows and we, we learn along the way and lick our wounds when we, we take losses because you're going to take losses and you're going to do some bad deals. But uh, it's really just sticking with it, man, sticking with it and, and yeah. having that passion to grow and to look for, for the next, the next you know, part of your journey. You know, it seems like you got all those pieces of the puzzle. You're you're wanting to grow and you're wanting to take it to the next level. And you're, you're probably starting your whole, like you started learning about single family homes. You're going through the learning process all over again with commercials, a whole new, whole new learning process. I mean, I, I studied for a year and a half before I took down my first multifamily deal, you know, yep. and, um, but it's not that scary. The more you learn about it, the more you realize how, how doable it is, you know? Yeah. One of the, uh, one of the things that we've done just here with, here within the last five or six months was uh, we bought, we bought a place out by the lake and I was, I, I try to be diligent and thoughtful about like every aspect of my life, not just the business side, but the family side too. And we ended up buying this place out by the lake that we were going to make an investment property, but then COVID happened and we ended up doing more of the work out here ourselves. Decided we liked it. So we moved into it, which is pretty cool. But then, uh, but then we also realized that we wanted to spend more time at the lake and we want to do some nice upgrades to the property. Well, how are we going to do that? We decided that we were going to uh, get our place fixed up nice, get some professional pictures, put it on Airbnb. And then the idea is use the money from that the Airbnb income is going to produce to buy an RV and spend more weekends at the lake with the family. So we probably do that twice a month and we let, you know, the, the hot tub, the pool, the RV, it's all being paid through income that we're getting from the Airbnb. And that's pretty, that's a pretty cool little trick that yeah. I really haven't heard many people talk about. It's a little bit unconventional because you're talking about Airbnb being out our personal residence, but it definitely is thoughtful and it definitely gets us spending more time on the lake as a family yeah. and, and all the expenses that would come with it have been paid. You know, we created that income stream to be able to pay for it. It actually worked so well that we bought the lot next door to us <laughs> and had a place. And we got a, we got a guest house that we use now when we want to have family over and we Airbnb that place when we don't have any family staying over. And I mean, it was like, how do we, cool. This worked really well. Let's buy the lot next door. How do we pay for that? Or better yet, how do we let someone else pay for that? And we still have the, uh, you know, the, the resources to be able to use it whenever we want. So that's kind of a cool little trick. I'm kind that of proud very of that cool, dude. See, you truly are the architect of your own life, man. I mean, you're designing the life you want. And it's, I mean, this was just a dream like five years ago, but I mean, it seems like you're basically 
finding a way to yeah to construct your perfect life man it's really cool man I, i love it i love the way you're thinking out of the box you know and every time you do something different like that it opens up a whole new channel of 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 opportunities and and mindset and direction if you want to take that direction but vacation properties you know airbnb vrbo stuff is, is a big deal i got a buddy that's building cabins uh where is it it's a broken boat and he he decided to build a vacation cabin there and it's like it's huge it's like a million dollar project i don't know the exact numbers but Um, they started building it and then they started getting offers to buy it for like 1.4 before they were finished with it. So like, well, shit, I'm going to buy it and build three or four more, you know, and, and it just led to that. And, uh, wow. yeah, there's, there's a lot of vacation rentals are really big. I haven't gotten into anything vacation. Rental. I wouldn't mind buying a condo, you know, somewhere in the mountains, you know, for ski slope in the ski areas, Breckenridge or something and VRB, be owing it or something, but I, I haven't gone there yet, but you're, you're a step ahead of me on that sucker. Well, you know, I think I picked it up on one of those bigger pocket podcasts, but they, but they say over and over, it's like, don't, you know, instead of in saying, instead of saying like, can I do this? Just rephrase the question. How can I do this? How can I do this? And it's like, how can we, how can we spend more time at the lake? Yeah. Let's make sure, let's make sure it happens. This will yeah. definitely do it. You know, how do we, how do we get a guest house and find a way to let it be paid through some other means other than just coming out of our pocket. And when you start thinking that way, it's like, hmm, how can I buy a vacation rental in every city that I like to go to? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, it really, it really starts to open up a lot of doors and a lot of really fun ideas. It's like, sure. I want to go to the mountains, sure. you know, I want to go to, I want a place, you know, on the Florida Keys. How, how do, how am I going to make that work? Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, it's funny you say that. I met a guy that multifamily, conference a few years ago and he owned airbnbs in like seven countries and yeah. i was talking to him i was like dude how do you do that he goes i just figure out where i like to go in vacation and i buy an airbnb there and i can he goes i don't even have a house anymore i just kind of move around all different countries and, and i travel and i'm looking for more airbnb locations and they basically kind of finance my lifestyle he was single he didn't have a wife or anything your kids to lug around but he was It was crazy, man. I was like, damn, that's a cool way to live. So same yeah. thing, man. If you get creative and, and you can you can live a crazy, crazy life, you know, a crazy, uh, yeah. independent, exciting life, man. You know, so uh, who knows, man? I got still got kids in school here, but, you know, I would like to have stuff around like that. But uh, right now, we, you know, we're, we're we got kids in the school system and all that. So and businesses here in Oklahoma, but. Who knows what the future holds, but that's really cool, man. I like the way you're thinking. I really do. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really fun once you once you start to realize, you know, all the doors that there are in front of you, you just got to start opening them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think this is, man, something like the kids used to teach. Wouldn't you love for them to see something, just kind of get this kind of information, open their minds up? It's you know? not taught. It, it's it's not really taught. not. You know, I mean, some of the some of those kids w who were paying a little bit closer attention would come into my office when I was band directing and they'd be asking me some of that stuff. And I was and I was I would show them everything that I'm doing. And it would just I mean, with some of them, it's like blow their mind. Yeah, it's like your teacher. Yeah. It's like that don't mean that don't mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's it's there. It's available. Yeah. You yeah. just gotta, you just gotta learn, gotta learn, and you gotta be willing to take the action. Yeah. So, that's plant all that takes. seed, baby. You gotta plant that seed. I like it. You yeah. Know? I mean, I have, I have a bachelor's in music ed, and I have a master's in music education. Nothing, nothing uh, in there gave me any, any direct education towards this. Yeah. You know, I, I can tell you what. I can tell you what flute fingers, are, flute fingerings are, but uh, <laughs> none of that, none of that really pertains to this business. Yeah, you, know, you just got to yeah. get out there and figure, figure it out. Yeah, they say Which that cool. uh, formal education will teach you how to get a good job. Self education will teach you how to be financially independent. 
That's what I've always College, teach, college teaches people how to be good employees. Good employees. High school, college, you learn to be a good employee, stay in the lanes, and then uh, self-education will teach you to get wealthy, independent, uh, financially independent, and, and, and live the dream life you want. So uh, get self-educated, I guess, is the moral to the story. <laughs> I, I grew up being, I grew up taught, I grew up being taught my entire childhood and into adulthood the debt was bad yeah and that was that was drilled into me from a young age consistently throughout and um man if some people knew how much that i was holding on to right now it it freak them out but um you know if you're leveraging debt to buy assets that are going to make you money that's not such a bad deal yes yeah so that's every kid should read rich dad poor dad any kids watching this you need to get a copy of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Start there. Robert Kiyosaki. There you go. Robert Kiyosaki. So, all right, brother. Well, how do, if people want to reach out to you, how do they get a hold of you? Uh, my email is jimmymartz83 at yahoo.com. That'd probably be the best way to get a hold of me. My my uh, ID on Bigger Pockets is James Martz. That's my legal name. So either one of those ways works works well. Perfect, man. It's great talking to you. Huge inspiration. Um, can't wait to see what you do here in the near future. We need to keep having coffee. I think we're going to do a deal together one of these days. We'll take down some big multifamily deal or something or some big industrial deal or something. <laughs> but, sure. uh, yep. dude, it's fun uh, fun talking to you, and I enjoy the conversation, and uh, let's get together soon, all right? Absolutely. Thanks, Rodney. Appreciate it. I right, man. Peace out, everybody. Right.